when I was 10, I think I must have been in class four or five, a teacher, a temp teacher came to our school. When that teacher came, there was something different about her, something that was quite admirable. And I thought, wow, she looks nice. And I remember Miss Kamal saying to me, she used to be one kid exactly like me. And I thought, what? You mean this is possible? Someone who was like me, like no food, walking this, this long distance, no shoes, can be like this? Can you imagine the kind of belief, the kind of hope that that builds in a child? And that is what happened for me. Amos Madra. Angela Karanja, author of the book Smuggled, a fantastic book, which we'll get into. Uh, also, uh, you are a child psychologist, adolescent psychologist, helping parents deal with their teenagers. Wow, I can imagine you must be in demand. <laughs> How are you? Thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm so, so grateful and I'm so grateful, Amos, for, for giving me this opportunity to have a chat with you and our lovely audience, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Angela, there's so many questions I want to ask you, um, but I always like to start from the beginning. Tell the audience about yourself, your childhood, uh, childhood growing up, and to the person that you are today, this fantastic author, businesswoman, psychologist and so much more oh brilliant so how long have we got like <laughs> like four, like 46 years <laughs> right so as as you said and i'm so thankful that you you introduced me so i am an adolescent psychologist and a parenting teenagers expert and um and obviously as a recently i'm this best-selling author so 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 grateful and I want to say that my journey started ages ago, and I want um, I want to mention an incident that happened when I was ten years old. I was born in Kenya, and I lived in in extremely extremely impoverished uh, situation, a childhood abuse, and you know all sorts of atrocities you would think being committed against children that was me something happened when I was 10 years old and this gave me hope now before I tell that story because I you've said for me to talk about before my before if you've ever seen or imagined you know those kids that uh, that are on TV, no shoes, like hungry and all that. I want you to imagine that I was one of those kids, right? And it's sometimes it's hard for me even to to piece those. I mean, I I I just don't want even to think about it because the incident I'm about to tell you. If it wasn't for that. I shudder at where I would be. When I was 10, I think I must have been in class four or five, a teacher, a temp teacher came to our school. And as you can imagine, our school was, was just a shack, something, it was a shack and no doors, no windows, just somewhere where loads of kids gathered every, <laughs> after walking miles and miles and miles, we gathered in there, right? So when that teacher came, there was something different about her, something that was quite admirable. And I thought, wow, she looks nice. And the one notable thing was that she had nice shoes. <laughs> and her shoes were clean. And I thought, whoa, I had seen teachers with shoes, but most of the shoes were dusty. Of course, they have to walk long distances and that. And some of my, my teacher's shoes had holes in them. And it wasn't anything to admire. But this particular one, 
comes in and I'm thinking, who? You mean such people or such things exist? I mean, as you can imagine, I'm like, oh, I want some of that, you know? <laughs> but here is what was even better about that lady. She was, she was, oh, she was, when I think about it, because she's, she'd come from university and uh, she was teaching as a temp, I think it was either, you know, when, when they go to do practice, teach, you know, or practicing and all that, right? So that's what she was there for. But I always say, she came there for me. She came there for me. She was there for me for such a time as that. So I remember her saying, well, anyone wants to come when it's lunchtime, anyone wants to come out and hang out with us? And I was like, teachers here don't ask us to hang out with them and of course you can imagine i'd already thought oh i want to hang out with that one right even before she asked so lunchtime came obviously i didn't have any food or anything i didn't have anything else to do so i joined her and she was so receptive and for the first time amos i felt seen as a child, I felt valued as a person. And then she offered me some food. This is something, you know, you don't, I didn't even expect her to offer. Of course, as a child, I'm hungry, I ate it. And then the next day, she asks again, who wants to come over? So me, I'm the first in line because I'm thinking, who? not only is she a nice person, she's got food, right? <laughs> so I'm there, right? And I remember Miss Kamal saying to me, she used to be one kid exactly like me. And I thought, what? You mean this is possible? Someone who was like me, like no food, walking this, this long distance, no shoes can be like this. Can you imagine the kind of belief, the kind of hope that that builds in a child? And that is what happened for me. And what I can say is a bond was built between me and her. Why? Because she was willing to be vulnerable. She was willing to share her story with me. Even though she was in that position of power, she was willing to share her vulnerability with me. And then one day, and that was just before she left, she said to me, do you realize that there is a school you could go to? And in that school, kids eat three meals a day. I, I cannot remember anything else she said, because my mind just got fixated. What? You mean there is places that kids actually eat? And you know, you, because where I was living, you didn't know whether you'd get food or not. It, there was no guarantees, right? And in my head, I, right at that point, I said, I'm going to that school. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is, but I'm going there. Because there's nothing as, as fear, as frightening, as anxiety building, as, as a child not knowing where the next provision will come to, uh, will come from. It's, you know, it's playing in your mind. It's playing in your mind. It's playing in your mind. And you have absolutely no control. And for me, this was food, right? Because that was what was missing. So to cut the long story short, the Miss Kamau left and I worked my backside off Amos. And when they said we needed to choose the schools, I chose that particular school. And I was, you know, I, there were many other choices to make and we had to, but I knew, you know, when you know that you know that's going to happen, that was me. And I can tell you, yes, I went to that school. 
But again, it wasn't an easy journey. It was my work. I worked hard to get there. But as you can imagine, my parents still didn't have uh, the finances <laughs> to, to support me whilst there. So that's a story for another day, how I made it in that school, because it wasn't easy. The amount of times I missed school because I didn't have school fees and I had to go and work in people's farms as a child to try and raise school fees. And how much does a child earn? Not a lot. So you can imagine the hours and the time and the back and forth. But that's a story for another day. So uh, run it past. I went, I went, uh, I, 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 I finished, I finished my schooling. And then I went to a college again. You know, the universe is always placing things. I think when you're focused, when you have a dream, when you have an idea, all things, you know, I think there's a verse, I can't remember where it is. I think it's a book. The lines have fallen on to mean pleasant places. They do, they do, absolutely. <laughs> and there's also, there's also a, a quote in, I think in Genevieve Biren's book, it says, mm. when your understanding grasps the power to visualize, your mm. heart's desire, it attracts all things requisite to the fulfillment of that image. Beautiful. Incredible. So, so yeah, so I, I went on, I, I know I have worked really hard for, for my, for, you know, for, for, to fulfill my, my dreams and all that. And then as, as I worked hard in my older age, I came, I came to England about 20 years ago, again, through working with young people. And then fast forward, what shall I say? Fast forward about three years ago, which is when the idea of writing the book Smuggled came to me. And I'll tell you the tipping point of that of that, uh, of, of that, I was working in this college and then this kid begins to tell me stuff, begins to tell me stuff. And I'm thinking, that this should not be happening to a child. This should not be happening to a child. This should not be happening to a child. Ideally, of course, I can't share all of the details here because of confidentiality. But essentially what was happening, that kid was a slave in the place he was staying. He was the slave and he had come from Germany. And what made me have my antenna is up was he said something that She's she's sort of my auntie. I mean, you know when someone is your auntie or not, or when your person is when the person is your dad or not, or when someone's your mom or not. But when the kids said, "She she's sort of my auntie," and then I put that together with. All the things he was doing. I know we expect our young people to be responsible. So I'm not in any way saying that the kids should not clean up them, themselves. They should not cook. I'm not in any way saying that. But the amount of work that kid was doing and then coming to college, I thought, no, this, this, is, this is not on. And here is what I did. I encouraged him to report this to safeguarding. And Amos, I took that kid up to the up to the door of uh, the safeguarding office, and he went in. And I don't know what they talked about again, because obviously I don't, I didn't have parental uh, permission to to go with him and share that information. I couldn't go in with him. But here is what completely broke my heart. The next day, that kid never turned up. Wow. That kid never turned up. And do you know, 
for the next couple of weeks, my head was running all over the place. You know, I used to drive to the college and I would look out just wanting to see him. And you know, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what where he went. I don't know. I don't know whether the auntie moved him away to somewhere else or, or I don't know. And that ripped me into pieces. And I asked myself, Angela, how can you hear these stories over and over and over again and not say something about it? Something to everyone. And that's when I decided to pen down this book on child exploitation and child trafficking. Because hand on my heart, I can, I can tell you that that kid had been trafficked from that other country from, uh, I, I don't know where he had originally come from, but he had come from through Germany. And then this, and everything that, everything that he was talking about, I knew that's not what should be happening to a kid, right? And that is what made me decide this is the last, almost the last case I'm keeping quiet about. Because here's the thing, Amos, I know I had been to salons, I had been to, to restaurants where I saw kids working long and odorous hours. And I had questioned it and I had reported it. And I remember one time I reported a kid who was working in a salon for really long hours. And I was thinking, this kid is the age of my daughter. She should be at school. And then that's, but this particular case of that kid in college, that's what made me say, no, more people need to hear what's happening and be able to spot and have the courage to talk about these things. Because th these are our kids. This should not be happening to any kid in this world. It shouldn't be happening. Yeah. I, yeah, so... That's how I came to write the book Smuggled. And uh, I, I, in a way, I am pleasantly surprised that it's done so well. But at the same time, I am not surprised that it's getting the attention of people because it's, it's quite empowering because the young people, the, the characters in there are actually young people who decide that this is not happening anymore. It's not happening on my watch. Incredible, absolutely incredible. I don't know where to pick up from from there. I mean, there's, there's so much. Um, what an incredible journey! What an incredible timeline of events, and so many things to dissect from that. I mean, just to you know, very tragic. First of all, with that young um, teenager. And we just hope that wherever they are today, that they're okay. And it's yeah. uh, it's, it's it's tragic that this still happens today. Mm -hmm. And it's good that there's voices like yours who are standing up against uh, this sort of heinous crime mm -hmm. and to make sure that this doesn't continue. And uh, the work that you're doing is incredible. And it's good that that book is out there for people to understand uh, because I think sometimes you can't relate to something if you don't understand it. So at least they can understand through your uh, work and uh, at least have some compassion uh, towards people who've gone through horrible things with no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, un unfortunately being in a different place and, uh, you know, compared to their counterparts somewhere who uh, are have, living in a, in, a, in a home that is filled with love, joy, and happiness. So every child deserves that opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's fantastic you're doing that. And your book is great for that. And we'll be talking about that very shortly. I want to go back to your upbringing, you, um, that young person. I think just hearing that story, there's so many things that I'd love to talk to you about. 
seeing that teacher, first of all, I like the fact that your first thing you noticed was her shoes. And uh, it's interesting, you know, they say that that's the first thing most people notice in somebody is their shoes. Um, so you saw this lady, you saw this image, and it was almost as though you were looking into your future. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a saying, you can't, you can't be it if you can't see it. So having that teacher there and having that, her, her impact you in such a positive way gave you that vision. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the power of visioneering, seeing something, and then working towards it because you became so diligent with your work, very consistent to make sure that you became the person that you are today. I am so glad, Amos, you brought that up. And there's been a lot of talk about representation. Representation is a hundred percent so, so important. And obviously at that time I didn't understand and I knew it impacted me positively, like you said. But as a psychologist, I know that modeling, when we see people who look like us, people who have achieved things, we can believe, we can believe, we can, we, we heighten our our antennas, and this is what happens. I'll, I'll, I'll give you all a quick, a, a, a quick uh, psychological uh, talk on the on the brain. What happens is, when you see something, it register it registers in your brain, and new neural paths are created, and it makes you believe that that thing is possible, right? And that is why when we talk about representation, when we talk about modeling, in fact, I credit Ms. Kamau for giving me a model that I use a lot when I, when I speak to parents about influencing our young people, when I speak to teachers about influencing our young people positively. And that model is, uh, it's modeling, being the person we are asking our young people to be. And then we don't leave it there. There is motivating, right? We must speak. Um, we must speak words of, of life to our kids, right? What, we know that our kids will rise or fall to the level that we believe for them, because that's how impressionable they are, right? And then we have we have um, we have modeling, mentoring and motivating so and mentoring how, how does mentoring happen for example when miss kamau shared her journey that in its own way i didn't know that at that time but when someone shares their journey it makes us you know it raises our level of belief and then it what it also does it perforates that that um uh, that sort of say, let's say, glass ceiling. And I, I don't know if you remember when uh, Roger Bannister, when he ran the four minute um, month, yeah. right? Mm. Do you know, as soon as he ran that, the next day, I mean, the next three kids, you know, little kids, old men, even I can almost run four minutes. <laughs> and before then, Doctor scientists, they had said, oh, it is impossible. It is impossible for a man to run that. But what did Roger Bannister do? He perforated that glass ceiling. And, be, and, and by doing that, he gave so many people that faith. He opened a door and people are like, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can be that. And that, for me, is what Miss Kamau did for me. I began to be, you mean, from this village, from this village, someone can go to, act, you know, someone, uh, you know, in just a few years, you can come back and be like this, you know? It, it gave me hope. It, it gave me belief. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean my situation at home changed. It didn't. But what happened was, 
there was this image in my mind that I held against all odds and I believed. And there's nothing as powerful as a person that believes. There's nothing as, a, as powerful as a person that believes. Because that thing, you know, that, that, that is the thing that makes a tiny person, you know, when there is fire, they will run in into the, into the fire and grab their kid from there. That, that belief, that, it is so powerful. It's a power that, that it, it's almost, we can't describe it. You know, only the person that believes knows that power of belief. And that is yeah. what, as teachers, as parents, as, as the society, it's very important that we imbue that in our kids by the way we, we behave, so modeling, by the way we speak, that's motivating the, the life we speak into them, and also mentoring, sharing, being vulnerable, being ready to share our journeys. Or if we, I mean, because we, I can't claim to have gone through all the troubles in this world. I can't. But I have gone through some, and possibly Amos, you've gone through some. Like just this minute, I mentioned Roger Bannister. That's his journey. And when we share these stories, it empowers these young people. Absolutely. And again, you know, when I think about you, uh, your classmates, you know, I can't imagine everybody um, took that same path and had that same influence and made that decision to commit to that goal. Um, so, you know, the opportunity is there for everybody, but we don't all respond the same way. You know, um, you said that you knew that that was where you're going to, there was no fear, there was no doubt. It was as clear as day. That mm -hmm. was your future. Mm -hmm. I knew. And, and again, that's why I said there's nothing as, as, uh, as you would say, you know, there's nothing as powerful as someone that believes <laughs> because the universe has to, you know, the, it, you know, everyone, I, I can't tell you the things that I, you know, the people that I attracted in my life, you know, people wanting to help. Why? Because they can see your train is moving. They want to jump on it. They want to bless it. But unfortunately, sometimes most of us, we sit and feel sorry for ourselves, right? I remember one person said to me in those days again is our job is to change the story not to sit there and, and feel sorry and that's something i know i'm always thinking how can i change this story instead of feeling, sitting here and feeling sorry for myself because we can do that there's always things to feel sorry for ourselves we've got so many disadvantages but we can focus on those. But on the other hand, we can focus on our dream. We can focus on what we want to be, on who we want to be. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, the book Smuggled um, is out. Um, how can the audience uh, get hold of this book? That lovely book is in all you know, all online and offline shops. It's also in, uh, it's in Kindle version. It's also in, uh, uh, actually, I wanted to show you. Shall I show you? <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So there we there go. it is. There it yeah. is. In its so full it, glory. It's in, in, in its full glory right there. And uh, so it's in, it's on Amazon. It's on I don't know which it's it's all over the place. So just just search "smuggled" by Angela Karanja, or walk into your bookshop and ask them for for a copy. If they haven't got some in stock, they will order some and and send it to you. It's there, and you know what? I honestly am asking every person, every parent, every teacher to read this book and it's not because I wrote it I mean of course you would you would feel I'm biased because I wrote it 
but the concepts presented there, they're just so, so powerful. If you look at the reviews, people are saying that I could feel myself in those situations. And they're saying, I was, I was literally shaking the book, asking the person, do something, do, do, do something. It's that visceral. It's quite palpable. And I must say, I'm thankful because I am blessed to be both a, a scientist, obviously as a psychologist, but I've got a very artistic part of me, which is why this book is so filled with imagery. Even sometimes when I read it, I'm like, what? And I have to pinch myself and say, you wrote it, you know that. <laughs> so yeah, get, get a copy for yourself, for your teenager and for your local library. These are some of the books that need to go in the library because the societal issues, this issue presented there, it will open, it will open your mind to, to things that you didn't know that are happening right next door to you. So, yeah. Incredible. Angela, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, just hearing your journey, what a remarkable person you are. Um, and I love your website as well, uh, raisingremarkableteenagers.com, uh, so people can find more about you there. But just you, you are remarkable. Um, you know, again, those images that people see on TV, you refuse to allow that narrative to be your final destination and for you to be that person. You know, you took hold of life by the horns and you changed the narrative. You changed your future. You changed who you are as a person. You changed your family. You changed your community. You've changed the world. You've done so much and you continue to do so with your incredible work. And uh, I can only just say thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you so much, Amos. I am so, so grateful. And as you said, it's not, this is not just available to me. It's available to everyone. Believing in yourself. In fact, yesterday I posted something that has gone quite viral about seeing, when we understand ourselves as lions, lions in our own territory, we never have to lose sleep over the opinions of sheep. So it's really important that we understand who we are, the nucleus of who we are. Honestly, each one of us was made for a great purpose. We are all so different. Like every blade of grass is different. But there is a purpose for you as long as you're breathing. And that's up to us to find out and not allow the opinions or the buttering or the disadvantages that are, are around us to push us down. But let's be those people who are always rising to the direction of our dream, to the direction of the sun. And I know it's available for everyone. I know that for sure. Because if it was available for me, me, oh gosh, I wish I had a picture to show you. I, my legs, my my toes. You know, you know, the, you know when, when your toes have you walked on, come on. The, you, come on, guys. We can do this. Hmm? <laughs> Angela, you're incredible thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so much for <laughs> this opportunity to share with you thank you if you want some amazing inspiration check out the videos next to me and i'll see you right there